Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's say thank you to the Steve Funds, to all of us that worked on bringing this um, incredible gathering. I'd like to start off first by introducing myself. My name is Tikkun Ashot <clears throat> I am Hawadi Nawasik at Syracuse University. I'm a faith keeper of the Honorable Wolf Clan. Uh, my native name is Tikkun Ashot My um, My uh, title of faith keeper. Uh, is for me to share the practices and beliefs of the Hadi and Shana Confederacy. Um, I would first like to start off by <clears throat> giving a greeting and thanks to all of nature all around us. Give thanks to everyone that is here. Give thanks to our extended families. Give thanks to the sun, the moon, the stars. Give thanks to Mother Earth for she provides all that we need. Give thanks for all the trees, the grass, the animals, the water. Give thanks for all these in the air, the birds, <clears throat> all of the plant medicines, all of the many things that we have to be grateful for. We're reminded in our teachings that every day we are to say thank you for all things. We've been given so many different um, gifts in our lives to recognize and be grateful for. So <clears throat> I would like to start off by doing a quick um, uh, meditation, a breathing exercise that kind of brings us all together in, in balance with each other. Um, we say thank you to the to the winds and the air because this is the air our ancestor, our ancestors have, um, have, have brought brought us here today. So, um, if you would please join me, um, please clap your hands together, and we are going to do this exercise of rubbing our hands together. And what this does is this brings forth our energy, kind of focus into our hands, and we are going to take a nice deep breath in as we wash our face with this energy. Just calming your energy down over the front of you, your arms, down to down your legs, down and back into the earth. When we come together, it is good that we all come together with a good mind, a like mind. And how we do this is we continually give gratitude for all things. We give thanks for all things. When we start our day off in the morning, we're to live in peace and gratitude and joy and help one another. And that's just a few of our uh, beliefs and teachings that we share as having and showing people. Um, and to be respectful of all things. Um, all of nature is our relatives. We are related to all of nature. Those are our relatives. That's like energy. So we need to respect all of energy, especially we respect all of nature because this is all our relatives. We are all related and we are all connected and we need each other. So this small exercise that I showed you, you can do this anytime to calm your mind, calm your heart, and have peace with them. It is the nature that reminds us to be happy and grateful and thankful for our things. I thank you for listening. I am please enjoy the conference today and thank you so much again for having me. And I will be back now and help. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you so much for that grounding. Okay, welcome students, faculty, administrators, faith leaders, and mental health experts. My name is Rajay Branch, and I am the Director of Families and Special Projects at the STEVE Fund. On behalf of the STEVE Fund and its board, I welcome you to Converge, the intersections of faith, spirituality, and mental health, made possible with the support from the John Templeton Foundation. For those unfamiliar with the Seed Fund, we are the nation's leading organization focused on supporting the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color. The Seed Fund works with colleges and universities, nonprofits, researchers, mental health experts, families, and young people to promote programs and strategies that build understanding and assistance for the mental health and emotional health of the nation's young people of color. The fund also holds an annual conference series, Young, Gifted, and at Risk, 
and offers a knowledge center with curated expert information. With multicultural mental health experts, the fund delivers on-campus and on-site programs and services for colleges and nonprofits. Through tech partnerships, we provide direct services to young people of color. We're excited to have you join us as we share the results of our recent research studies surrounding faith and its impact on our young people and their mental health. We have a robust schedule for today, including workshops, panels, and an interactive call to action where you will have the opportunity to co-create solutions to support students. While you're with us, we invite you to check out our resource center and sponsor booths in the lobby so you can learn more about our partners and access any resources you may need. If you have not already filled out our, our conference pre-survey, please take a moment to do that. The link is now provided for you in the chat. At the conclusion of this conference, we will also invite you to fill out a survey about your experience. For your time, you'll have the chance to win a gift card. We thank you again for joining us today and hope you enjoy the experience. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jazz Robbins. Dr. Jazz is a therapist and board certified holistic nutritionist. She earned her bachelor's degree from North Carolina State University in food science and nutrition and master's and doctoral degrees in clinical psychology from my alma mater, Pepperdine University. Go Waves! She has been teaching graduate level courses since 2020 and holds leadership positions within the Los Angeles County Psychological Association, as well as the California Psychological Association. The topic of her keynote today is mental wellness in university settings, overcoming spirituality and other hurdles. Without further ado, we welcome Dr. Jazz. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that warm introduction and welcome to everyone. I'm incredibly excited to spend this time with you today and I'm excited to talk about this topic. It's one that's near and dear to my heart and hopefully I can offer some insight and some encouragement throughout my talk today. Um, following our wonderful grounding experience this morning, I wanna take a pause for a moment, just for a mindful moment to just settle in. Let's settle in, let's notice our bodies, notice our positioning, let's allow our bodies to find a natural sort of comfortable position as we get ready to listen and learn and participate today, allow our bodies to send any energy to places that might feel tense or that might feel a little bit stress. Um, let's offer gratitude for being on this side of life and at the same time send warmth to any parts of us that may be grieving those that we've lost recently or not so recently. Let's offer gratitude for our participation in today's events and any wisdom that we might gain from today. And then as we begin, let's just take a collective inhale followed by a collective exhale for gratitude and appreciation. I really want to talk about three things today. Number one, hashtag student life. Number two, I want to offer some encouragement for all of my students here today. And then number three, I want to offer encouragement for faculty and staff as well. Before I get started, I want to say a little bit more about me in terms of my positionality and how I come to this topic specifically. So again, I'm Dr. Jazz Robbins. I use she, her pronouns. I am an African-American Christian female who attended private Catholic school from pre-K through eighth grade. I am a therapist. I'm a nutritionist who earned three degrees from predominantly white institutions. I'm a university professor of graduate studies at multiple institutions. I'm a former therapist within a university counseling setting, and I'm a survivor of complex trauma. So I share that with you to know that th I'm coming with all of those things to this particular conversation with you today, and that gives you some insight to my lens as well. In terms of questions, I ask that you hold them to the end. I'm only sharing with you a brief moment, and I want to make certain that I'm able to get through everything. Um, slides for my talk have been provided in the Resource Center for you as well. 
So let's start with hashtag student life. Let's paint this picture. The life of a college student, you are balancing so much. I don't have to tell you that, right? You're juggling a lot. There's a lot of spinning plates. Uh, many, many of our college students are emerging adults, um, although our college um, students can span the lifespan. The bulk of us are going to be emerging adults you're navigating family expectations, you're navigating social expectations, you're navigating self-imposed expectations that you've placed on yourself. You are coming into this college experience, leaving the past with hope and anticipation for this, in, this expected future that you have. The entire experience of college life, of university life is incredibly future focused. It leaves little room to be present focused. It leaves little room to really, really engage with the present moment. It leaves a lot of room and a lot of space for stress and anxiety. During this time, you are developing or you might find yourself reinventing yourself. During this time, you might find yourself thinking or even saying out loud, that's who I was, this is who I want to be. This is who I'm going to craft myself into being for this future that I'm developing. You're crafting this self meticulously with intention. You're being organized. You're being resourceful. A new self-care challenge is on social media every single week, and you're doing your best to keep up. But sometimes those things leave yourself wondering, am I doing enough? Will I get this future that I have set on this pedestal? Will I get the things that I'm aiming for? If I get them, will I be ready for them when I get there? You're doing your best. You're doing your best. You're trying to keep up with the academic rigor, with the academic demands, and also, again, with these social demands and all of these things that we're seeing coming out on social media at the same time. For some of us, many of us, something happens and it is the quintessential last straw. The camel's back has broken. You've been juggling so much. You've been stretched so thin. It doesn't take much to break this poor camel's back. When this happens, you find yourself crumbled under the emotional weight of everything. You might feel let down by the system. You might feel let down by your family. You might feel let down by friends. You might feel let down by higher education. This massive system that sometimes feels like it was not created with you in mind. Somehow, while surrounded by a campus full of peers, in these moments, you feel incredibly alone, incredibly isolated incredibly distant. And then the question is, where do I turn? Well, some have been taught to turn to faith, to turn to spiritual practices during these times in particular. Lean on that faith, lean on that spirituality that perhaps was given to you through your family. It's possible that Though you've seen information about counseling services offered at your college that you might feel torn about taking that step. What would it say about me if I did that? Something must be wrong with me if I'm even considering that. For some uncertain of what to do, of where to turn, of where to go, some confide in a trusted professor. And for you in that moment, finally, someone's listening. Finally, I get to sort of unload all of this weight, all of this stress that I've been carrying. Though the professor may not fully understand 
It's a listening ear that isn't family, that isn't friend, and you're hopeful that at the very minimum, this individual will normalize your situation. They'll normalize your circumstances. They'll let you know that you're not crazy. Nothing's wrong with you. That's what you're hoping for in that moment. As you unpack, the tears are likely beginning to flow simply because you're finally able to give voice to all of the things that you've been carrying and juggling for this extended period of time. For some professors, that emotional overwhelm, that outpouring can be really, really, really overwhelming for them. It might even be scary. To see a student in that much pain, in that kind of hurt, for some professors, it can be a lot to deal with. So what do you do? Well, let me now offer some encouragement for my students. To all of the students, I can hear the sound of my voice. You are multifaceted. It is possible for you to love your family and appreciate their values while still creating and upholding values of your own. You can absolutely do both. There's space for that. As you navigate this life as a university student, you don't have to forego one for the other. There's space for both. Number two, it is possible for you to have faith and hold true to your spirituality while still seeking the counsel of a trained expert. Again, the two can exist in the same worlds at the same time. In the same way that it's normalized to get regular dental checkups every six months, even when there's no issue, even when there's no pain, it's quite normal to get a mental health checkup in the same fashion. Unfortunately, society hasn't caught up to that normalization just yet, but it is absolutely normal, absolutely needed and necessary for many of us. To my college students, I wanna say that you are not broken. You are overwhelmed. You are likely stressed. You may be experiencing symptoms of anxiety. You may be experiencing symptoms of depression. What's anxiety look like? Worry, constant worry, especially in this space, in this place that is so future focused. Worry about what's due tomorrow, what's due next week, what classes I'm supposed to be taking next term. Will I get the professor that I want to get? What, I'm what am I going to be doing for summer internship? What am I going to be doing after graduation? Will I be set up in the same way that maybe some of my peers are set up? Worry. Depression might look like sadness. It might look like disconnection. It might just feel like irritability for some. And these symptoms could be due to school. It could be due to the academic rigor. It could be the result of things in your life before you came to school, before you came to college. You led a full life. You came into this space with that life. And if that life had any difficulties, college, academic rigor, the demands, these new responsibilities have made that feel even heavier. Higher education, unfortunately, was not designed with your self-care in mind. So it makes sense that you're feeling overwhelmed. It makes sense that you're feeling stressed. Anyone in your situation 
would have a similar experience. You are not broken. Know that both can coexist. Faith, religion, spirituality can absolutely coexist with mental health, with mental wellness. There's space for both on your mental health journey. You are allowed, believe it or not, to request a therapist or a counselor who will integrate your spiritual beliefs into the work that you're doing with that person. Me personally, I've worked with Christian clients who've asked for prayer to be a part of the work that we're doing. I've worked with Hindu clients who have taken the time to educate me on their spiritual practices so that I'm aware of how that is uh, protective for them and effective for them as a stress uh, management skill or as a coping mechanism and a part of their healing journey as well. I've worked with Native American clients who have utilized Native practices as a part of their healing journey. I've worked with Jewish, Jewish clients who have also used their Jewish faith and their Jewish practices as a part of their healing journey. I've worked with Santerian clients. I've worked with Wiccan clients. I'm sharing this with you because I need not share their beliefs, but as a therapist worth any salt, I do have to hold space for those beliefs, particularly when they're telling me that these beliefs and these practices are sacred to them and have been sacred to them for some time. I lean on my client to educate me on those practices so that I have a better understanding and we can absolutely fold them into the work that we're doing. Both can coexist. You do not have to let one go to work in within the realm of the other. To my students, I wanna say that you are stronger than you think. There is strength in asking for help. Understand that the opposite, not asking for help, it leads you to becoming less like the person that you ultimately want to be. Know that the stress and the overwhelm that you feel, it's got to get expressed and it will get expressed. Almost like whack-a-mole. You try to suppress it and it's going to come up someplace else. That kind of energy, it can't be contained. It can't be suppressed. It might show up as illness. It might cause you to lash out at folks who don't deserve it. It may lead you to behaving in ways that you later regret. Ah, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Oh, that wasn't my best moment. That wasn't my best self. I wish I hadn't done that. Stress, anxiety, depression, overwhelm. If we aren't unpacking it and processing it, it shows up in other ways in our lives. So know that there's absolutely strength in asking for help. I'd also like to say that therapy will never be more uh, cost-effective than it is for you as a university student. Take full advantage. You're missing out. Absolutely, you're missing out if you're not taking advantage of it while you're a student on campus. Now to my faculty, I wanna offer some encouragement to you. The system asks a lot of you. Oh my goodness, you are an instructor. You are a mentor. You are a parent. You are a student advocate. You are a human person doing a job that requires you to interact with humans who are navigating one of the most demanding periods of their lives. You both have it hard. Faculty, student, you both have it hard. Even still, 
to my faculty, it is not outside of the scope of your competence to lend a listening ear when a student expresses distress. That's well within your wheelhouse. Though their overwhelm may be activating for you, more often than not, your simple validation, your reassurance, will go a long way to mending and alleviating some of that overwhelm and some of that stress that they're experiencing. Let's be clear, it's important that you ask the most important question to this student. Are you having thoughts of death, dying, or taking your own life? You have to ask that question. And if the answer is yes, this is absolutely an individual that you need to walk over to the counseling center or make a referral to the counseling center immediately. If the answer is no, take a moment to hear them out so that you're able to discern their needs because this student may benefit from other resources on campus that you can connect them to. Maybe they might benefit from tutoring services, perhaps emergency housing, learning accommodations, emergency food, emergency meal services, if we get overwhelmed by the tears immediately, we might not get to that and realize, oh my goodness, we, we can assist you with this, absolutely. So again, ask the important question, get that answer. And then if the answer is no, listen to see how we might be able to offer this individual some assistance. To my faculty, I wanna say lean on your colleagues for support. Your job is not an easy one by any stretch of the imagination. You too are in need of self-care. You too are in need of a cadre of individuals that you can lean on. Don't be afraid to consult. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to be human. Higher education is challenging no matter the role that you play, no matter who you are, and know that you don't have to go it alone. You're allowed to consult. You're allowed to debrief with trusted peers. And to keep it real, when you consult, when you reach out, when you debrief, it keeps you from resenting the work that you're doing. From kinder through higher education, all instructors have found themselves at once or, or another time sort of waving their fist to the heavens. The system isn't giving me the resources that I need. I feel like my hands are tied. They won't let me do what I need to do to help my students. When we connect as professors and instructors, faculty and staff, when we connect, when we lean on our peers, on our colleagues, it gives us the support to continue to do the work that we actually love doing in spite of the system. So in terms of takeaways, number one, I wanna say, widen your perspective. Let's lead with compassion. To my students, you are a full and complex human navigating a complicated human experience. That is the truth. To my faculty, you have one of the most rewarding jobs in existence, yet you too are burdened. And to the both of you, I want to say, lead with compassion for yourself. Start there. You are doing a lot, you are juggling a lot, and it is absolutely okay for you to ask for help. To my faculty, I wanna say lead with compassion for others. Absolutely do your job and try not to leave your humanity at the door in the process. To all those who can hear the sound of my voice, 
the counseling center on your campus is more than willing to help you in your time of need, be it a crisis or be it just sort of uncertainty around a peer relationship that you're navigating, perhaps that has gotten difficult or complicated. They're always there and they're always welcome to lending a listening ear and connecting you to other resources. Don't be afraid to connect. Don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to lean on those services, particularly while you have them in such abundance while you're a university student. And with that, I will pause and take any questions if anyone has them. Or comments are people saying things in the chat thank you thank you so much to everybody as a student what are ways we can support our peers thank you so much for that question so um who there's a number of ways. I never want to um, sort of feel like I'm training students to be therapists, right? That that's not what I'm hoping to do. But I do want students to know that you are often sort of first line defense when it comes to um, the mental wellness, not only of yourself, but of your peers as well. Oftentimes peers are going to lean on peers before they lean on other individuals. So I would listen for um, those signs of distress from your peers to sort of discern if this individual, again, might benefit from other resources on campus. And if you're not sure what your campus has to offer, because oftentimes campuses are thick with resources that students are like, I didn't even know we had this at school. Oh my gosh, we have what? You can, you, the counseling center will get you connected at the very, very least. And we don't, we don't mind. We don't mind whatsoever. So from student to student, I would say, listen. And again, if that distress sounds like it would, it could benefit from a professional or at least from resources that you know of or may not know of, you can absolutely bring that person to the counseling center and the counselors there will um, assist and or get them connected to other services on campus. Um, it is wonderful to hear how you incorporate spirituality for client treatment. Do you help other mental health professionals do that well? And do you feel that other professionals are comfortable doing that? Thank you for your question. Um, some professionals aren't comfortable doing that, and that's okay, um, which is why I led with from the consumer, from the client, from the student's perspective, it's you are okay to advocate for yourself, and I encourage you to advocate for yourself to say, I'm looking for um, a therapist who will allow me to integrate blank. Or you can straight up say, I'm looking for a Jewish therapist, a Christian therapist, a Muslim therapist. You can do that as well. Sometimes depending on the institution or facility, that may, individual may not be there, but they may have a therapist or a counselor on staff that is welcoming to um, your spiritual practices coming into the work. Some aren't comfortable with that, perhaps because they themselves don't practice a particular religious tradition or spiritual tradition, and they might feel um, like uh, maybe fraudulent or something like that if they try to do it and they don't quite have a handle on it for themselves. Again, completely okay. And I don't have any judgment for those individuals. I appreciate them saying, you know what, that's not my area of expertise, but I do have a colleague that's great with integrating spirituality into the work of a mental health clinician. And in terms of do I train others? So um, not quite, but I do have a mentor who is great at that kind of training. I worked with him, trained with him for a couple of years and um, still continue to lean on his research and writings to help fine tune the work that I do. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome.
Can you repeat the mandatory question? Yes, the mandatory question. Are you having thoughts of death, dying, or taking your own life? You have to ask that question so that you can determine the severity of this individual's um, stress, distress at that moment, because if they are having thoughts of death, dying, or taking their own life, that does require immediate attention by a trained clinician. If that is not the case, then again, as a professor or um, other faculty member, you do have space to sort of hold, listen as much as you can, as much as you can, right? And connect them with other services or resources on campus as appropriate. That was really enlightening and it confirmed so many things for me. I appreciate your words of wisdom and I will continue on this path of being who I am called. This is so good, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I see the gratitude in the chat. Thank you, everybody. Anything else before? Yes, time for one more question, exactly. <laughs> Anything else? Um, with that, I will say a huge thank you to the Steve Fund, to the Templeton Foundation. Thank you so much for allowing me to share a bit of my thoughts and my wisdom with everyone today. And I hope you all enjoy the remainder of today's events. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jazz. Can we just give Dr. Jazz another round of reactions, whether that's a heart, applause, whatever it is. So many words of wisdom that I'm taking away from your talk. Um, for me, I really appreciated how you touched on the duality that we often experience as humans, whether it's balancing the presence and the future or balancing counseling and spirituality or even balancing the values we were raised with the value between the, val the values that we are developing um, as we grow older. So thank you so much. And as we continue with the conference today, we appreciate y'all continuing to share your questions in the chat and also um, adding your takeaways as well so that we can learn from one another. Um, so my name is Brandi Pretlow, and I'm the Vice President of uh, Programs and Services at the STEE Fund. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm so grateful to be in this community today to learn alongside um, all of these experts and professionals and every single one of you. I really do value everyone's thoughts and think that we can learn from one another. We are particularly excited about our next session. Throughout the last year, with support from the John Templeton Foundation, we conducted research with five university partners focusing on the intersection of spirituality, religion, and mental health among students of color. We are pleased to hear from students, mental health professionals, and faith leaders working with students. I thank our university partners on this project, American University, Marymount University, Morgan State University, Trinity Washington University and University of Michigan. And if y'all are in the house today, feel free to use reactions. Um, we appreciate all of the support and all the work that you've done to get us to this point in having this conference. Um, so we know many of the participants in the study are joining us today and we thank you for your participation. Dr. Sherry Mullock is here to discuss the initial findings and lead our call to action discussion to inform continued research and identify resources among our community of practice. Dr. Sherry Mullock is an associate professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Dr. Mullock graduated with honors from Dartmouth and earned a master's degree and a doctoral degree in clinical community psychology from the University of Maryland College Park. Shout out to Maryland. Dr. Mullah graduated with the honors um, with a Master of Divinity degree from Howard University. Also shout out to Howard. And Dr. Mullah, it is my pleasure to hand the mic over to you. Can we welcome her in again with another set of reactions, applause, and I'll pass the mic over. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I want to, um, as I go ahead and share my screen, Yay, that's gonna work, yay.
Can you all see that? Someone give me a thumbs up. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much for that warm introduction. I particularly want to thank my colleague, Dr. Jazz, for her wonderful, wonderful keynote address. Many of the things that she said will be resonated or will be reinforced with the results of the study. I wanted to really focus on two things I thought that she said that were really important. That is really true that you will get the most cost-effective treatment you will ever have in your life at the university. And it's accessible and oftentimes it's free. And also that for my um, faculty colleagues that sometimes it just takes a listening ear. And sometimes people feel like they don't have mental health background in their training, that there's nothing they can do, but you can just be a good listener. And the thing I always say is remember this is somebody's child. So with that, with no further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you about um, bridging the gap between students, faculty, staff and administrators to enhance campus resources with a specific focus on the intersection of faith, spirituality, and mental health. And as people have said earlier, we're gonna be particularly thankful to the John Templeton Foundation for actually um, funding this research project. So the Steve Fund received the funding from Templeton Foundation to conduct a study that would inform programming on the intersection of religion, spirituality, and mental health. The study was designed to answer a few questions. How do we encourage and promote greater collaboration on campus between spiritual leaders and mental health professionals? How can we encourage better collaboration between those two communities, as particularly sharing resources? And how can we develop cultural competency to ensure that we're addressing all the needs of all the students? So we conducted um, online surveys with undergraduate, mostly undergraduate, but some graduate students from communities of color. We asked some questions about their demographic background, any barriers that they perceived to um, seeking mental health counseling. And then we also asked about um, their spiritual and religious well-being and their involvement religiously, either private religious devotions like reading scripture or listening to um, uh, religious music or something more formal, which would be in, intending a, a community of faith a church or a mosque or a temple. We also conducted semi-structured interviews with campus mental health professionals and faith leaders who were members of a faith community. And for the mental health professionals, we asked questions about what they thought some challenges were incorporating, as you heard Dr. Jazz say earlier, students' beliefs, faith beliefs into the counseling session. And for faith leaders, we asked questions around, did they talk about mental health issues or concerns and help seeking? And did they have a ministry in their faith community that specifically focused on helping people deal with and address mental health challenges? So our goals were to, um, to do surveys on 250 students over five university campuses and to conduct semi-structured interviews with five mental health professionals and five faith leaders per campus. So we're trying to survey a total of 250 students and a total of 50 faith leaders and mental health um, leaders because it was five on each campus. We ran into, as many of us already know, we ran into COVID and COVID significantly um, made it more challenging for us, not only to reach students, but also to do the interviews with the mental health staff and with the faith leaders. Also, um, this is a perennial problem when you do research that the academic calendar doesn't always match up to the funders calendar than to the organization doing the, um, doing the research. So for example, we had some campuses where there weren't mental health um, professionals on campus during the summer. And then there are some campuses where that, that is not the case. And then we also ran into, um, a little surprising that in some universities, there's not a lot a large clergy presence on campus. And sometimes it's, um, they don't have as many mental health staff members either. So let's talk about the survey results with the students first. It was a culturally diverse um, sample, but about 54% of the students were black. And then you see other um, racial and ethnicities also represented. Um, predominantly female, which is again, very typical for most college campuses. This is just showing you the number of students at each university. So the top university was Marymount with 88 students participating. And then the, um, the lowest number came from American University. We had a really good representation in terms of years in school. So from freshmen on up to seniors, and again, a small percentage of people were graduate students. And so the sample characteristic, the eight mean age or average age was 21, with most of the sample being under the age of 25. Most people did not have children. Most people were domestic um, students. So this is a pretty quote unquote traditional um, college sample, GPA ranging in the two to 2.9 range. Most a uh, slightly over majority of students um, endorse religion as being important or very important to them. 
about 36 or a third said it was, they were neutral about their religious beliefs and 8% said that it was not important to them. Uh, a little bit surprisingly, younger participants were less likely to engage in religious practices. Um, for people who did say that religion was more important to them, um, it was very high, a significant number of them endorsed higher spiritual beliefs and were more likely to engage in religious practices, including prayer, reading sacred texts, or again, attending a formal institution of religion. And higher spiritual beliefs were associated with more frequent engagement in religious practices. So these are all things that we would expect to have happen. Um, interestingly, students with higher spiritual beliefs tended to have more negative beliefs about counseling. So they were less likely to want to engage in counseling experience. So the, these, just for the student surveys, the early preliminary analysis point to the potential need to explore the relationship between spiritual beliefs and experience mental health, need to determine whether higher spirituality conveys protection against mental illness, but it could also in fact serve as a barrier to mental health care. If students from communities of color who have high spirituality also require mental health care, that means that their spiritual beliefs um, may be associated with negative attitudes about counseling, which then may hinder them from seeking mental health care. And then we also need to identify if and how these groups access and utilize mental health care systems is critical to enhancing their um, well being in ways that are consistent with their faith beliefs. And we'll talk a little bit about that in detail in a minute. So these are the results for the semi structured interviews. And then again, this was, um, we assessed. We're able to do these interviews with um, six mental health professionals and six faith leaders. So from these interviews, several themes emerged and I'm just gonna go over the themes real quickly and just give you an example of each theme. So one of the themes that was emerged from the interviews was what are the things or strategies that can encourage students to seek mental health services, including not just making referrals, but including kind of taking destigmatizing, having conversations about mental health challenges. So a mental health professional said, we would kind of like talk about it, meaning mental health with students, saying things like we're checking our gauges, like your physical, spiritual, emotional, and health, and how are you doing in these categories? So that would be their way to facilitate help seeking. A faith leader said, we would advise them, hey, you should be bringing up your mental health concerns to your therapist, that question you're having about this, or hey, I know we've been talking about that problem with your sister or your dad, and we want to keep processing and praying and thinking through how you can relate better with, but that issue that you're having trouble with might be something that your therapist might not know you struggle with. You could bring this up to them. And what interestingly, one of the things that the faith leader said was they felt that people that they um, talked to um, who have mental health challenges may not always be bringing up those mental health challenges to their therapist. So they were encouraging them to be more open with um, sharing with their therapist things that were concerning them. Another thing that came up that a theme that came up was barriers to mental health seeking. What are those things that make it difficult for students to seek out mental health services? And one of the mental health professionals said that we need gatekeepers or people that um, who are trusted adults, either faculty or staff that can help actually help refer students to on campus mental health centers. And one mental health professional said, I'm not sure if students of color still feel as comfortable as they could with them just expressing their need or their desire for counseling. I think that's more of an extension of maybe like the gap between the student and the, in this case, the a mental health center on campus. And another mental health professional says, so that missing piece, that link either is a professor or another, like a campus partner, or you know, someone else who can say, the center, I can verify that the center is there and that they're supporting students of color. So in other words, students need to hear from people that they trust that it's okay to go to the mental health or the counseling center on campus. And then a faith leader said it's challenging to find good mental health resources, both on and off campus, but particularly for students who may need psychiatric care, which might involve medication. And so one faith leader said it's hard to find, it's hard to find good counseling in some situations. Another faith leader said, sadly, not everyone is able to have access, whether it's affordable or not. A lot of the times you have to almost like know someone to get to see somebody in this area. So. Um, for faith leaders in particular, this issue around um, how do they find the mental health resources for students either on and off campus. Um, when we talk to ask people about strategies to address potential barriers to mental health help seeking, um, the mental health professional said we need to develop more partnerships to reduce stigma. And the person says, so some of the strategies that we use to remove the barriers is um, showing up, showing up and partnering with different clubs and organizations at events 
to make ourselves known, doing workshops and webinars for students to dispel myths about mental health. So this mental health professional was suggesting that mental health professionals go where the students are instead of waiting for students to come to them and maybe going to different clubs or organizations or events and talking about um, mental health and help seek and the importance of doing that. And then when faith leaders said, one, one way to address barriers was to reduce stigma. And they said, I know that my colleagues who are serving in the black community have really been pushing hard in that community on sort of removing the stigma, encouraging people to sort of continue to push forward. Then another thing that emerged quite a bit um, was the intersection between mental health and faith and how do you integrate faith and spiritual beliefs into mental health treatment. So one of the things that many of the mental health professionals talked about was giving students quote unquote permission to bring up religious and spiritual beliefs. And sometimes that might mean that the mental health professional actually brings this topic up. And so one person said, it's like a collaborative effort in terms of getting to know the individual and it's about that rapport and then making it a safe space so that they feel totally comfortable and letting them know if, that, if that's their wish in terms of bringing up their be religious beliefs that we're willing to do that. So they were kind of saying, maybe these students don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't know how well bringing up spiritual beliefs will be received in a therapeutic setting, but that sometimes the mental health professional can bring it up or let students know directly or indirectly that this is a safe space where we can talk about your belief system. And then a faith leader said um, that there are actual mental health challenges that are in sacred texts and sometimes bringing up those scriptures I know my other hat, I am also a pastor of a church and we, I preach a lot about mental health challenges and concerns as a way of destigmatizing these topics in my church. So the faith leader said, in terms of mental health, I think we go to the scripture and find, you know, Jesus healing people suffering from mental health. We just, we're not judging, we're listening. Okay, and trying to offer a presence, a calming presence to anyone who's sick with any kind of illness. And then we taught um, another theme that emerged was strategies for integrating faith and mental health treatment. Um, so one of the things that a mental health professionals talked about was increasing mental health literacy. So one person says, so maybe we can educate. Okay, educate people about mental health issues. If you do this in a faith community, faith-based community, then maybe you're more likely to have buy-in because it's coming through the faith-based community. Maybe you can go to somebody's church or through somebody, you know, through someone's church, we do workshops. So again, there's this sense of maybe we need to bring the information to the students or bring the information to the faith community to get more buy-in. And then a faith leader talked about developing partnerships with mental health professionals. And so one person said, so I think that there's been a shift, especially in how the pastors counsel those in crisis. We see a growing number of pastors even have large church staffs or large canvas ministries staffs and partnering with mental health professionals within and outside the church to address needs. And then another person said, I think we assume that we could address them, but we are recognizing that this is probably a category, you know, like diabetes or broken arm or cancer, like we're gonna simultaneously pray for those things, but we also need to get people help. So I think this person was talking about that there was a time in the church, particularly, you know, I can speak for the black church, where maybe pastors felt that they could address mental health challenges themselves, but more and more they're realizing that, that they're part of a team and that in the team approach, people have their different expertise and that we need to partner with mental health professionals to maybe address mental health crises. So just in terms of the, uh, the study itself, there were some limitations, there's missing data. Uh, we probably needed to um, reach out to more diverse groups of people, particularly in from religious communities. Most of the students who were, um, and the faculty and the faith leaders who were and involved in the survey and the study are from Christian backgrounds. The sample is also predominantly black and other racial ethnic groups may have different religious practices, historically different um, traditions. For example, um, in the Latinx community, people are more likely to be Catholic. And then um, some of the schools that were actually in the study were religious institutions and the sample is too small to sort of parse this out, but it might make a difference in terms of how central religious beliefs are to the students on campus based on the type of school they went to. So from, based on this, um, we have some recommendations we'd like to make. Um, many students from communities of color report that their faith is important to them. So we really wanna encourage mental health providers to inquire about the role that faith leads may play in student well-being, and how, and Dr. Jazz brought this up, how can faith leads be helpful, but also sometimes faith leads are also challenging. And that we also definitely need to reduce stigma we need faith communities and counseling staff to partner together 
and to engage in mutual activities. And I think this is really important because students need to see both of the communities, mental health communities and faith-based communities working together because that in and of itself, they say a picture is worth a thousand words is really a powerful way to, um, to give an example of the two can work together and don't have to be at odds. Mental health providers can point out the benefits of the faith community in terms of mental health. Faith leaders can also help destigmatize mental health challenges by normalizing the conversation through your um, educational experiences, through podcasts, through sermons. And then faith leaders can also um, partner with mental health community to change norms about mental health help seeking. So that's the end of my presentation. I want to thank you for your time and your attention. And I believe we are now going to break out into uh, small breakout rooms. Is that correct? Oh, I am muted. That is correct. So first, can we give a round of applause um, just to Dr. Mullick for presenting these findings of this exploratory research project? Um, super informative. Um, we do want to give folks time to kind of wrestle with um, the information that Dr. Mullick just shared. Um, and so we're going to have a moment. In just a moment, we're going to move into breakout rooms. And we have three themes for these breakout rooms. One is balancing mental health and spirituality. Um, two is faith community and mental health professionals partnerships. And three is involving families in mental health and faith slash spirituality. And so what we'll do is y'all y'all will have the option to join any one of those breakout rooms. Each session will have a recorder and a presenter. And at the end of the breakout rooms, we're going to bring us all back together um, to just reconvene and discuss what are some of the things that some of the key themes, the key questions um, and key things to explore um, as a group from those breakout room discussions. Um, so I believe we are going to open up the breakout rooms. Um, and if there is an issue with someone, you can move yourself, but if you're having an issue with moving yourself, please just raise your hand and we can have um, a person from the Steve Fund team assist you with that. And then I see that there's a question in the chat we can make sure to come back to all the questions um, once we return from the breakout rooms. All right, enjoy. And if anyone's having a hard time finding the breakout rooms, you should have a little like notification saying you've been invited to a breakout room. If not, if you look at the menu at the bottom of your screen, there should be an option for breakout rooms there. And you can see that there are three different ones. Okay, great. So hopefully everyone was able to participate in their breakout room and um, now's the time where we're going to kind of come back together and report out. And so if we can have the first group, um, did each person, did each group nominate someone to speak out or report out for their group? Uh, I think we were the first group balancing spirituality and mental health. And yes, we were we have the lovely Caitlin to share more about that very vibrant and rich discussion that we had. 30 minutes was not enough, but I understand it was a, it's a it's a it's a heavy topic. It's a meaty topic, and I think the group had a lot to share. Great. So, Caitlin, if you can share what your group talked about with balancing mental health and spirituality. Yes. Hello, everyone. So, in this breakout room, we talked a lot about ways that faith beliefs can promote mental health, ways that it can pose barriers to mental health. And we also talked about how can faith leaders and mental health practitioners destigmatize mental health and normalize it in the communities. So in terms of how it can promote mental health, we talked about how um, faith beliefs promote that community, that human connection that we that um, communities can have together and 
we also talked about structure found in prayer, meditation. How do we incorporate those things to think about clearing our mind, grounding ourselves when you're having a hard time? In terms of barriers, we talked about fear and guilt and how sometimes people may question, does it make my faith any less if I'm struggling? So things like that, you know, your perceptions, and then in ways that how do faith leaders help destigmatize mental health? Um, just talking more about their personal experiences and offering resources and incorporating resources into their, for example, we talked about having certain books and their um, at their disposal to suggest to their um, community members that talk about mental health stories and having just a shared language and understanding that, okay, let's talk about what does mental health really mean? Um, what are these definitions? What do, what, what do diagnoses mean? And stuff like that. So people can have a common knowledge and understanding. So we talked a, a, a lot and as we just mentioned, it's 30 minutes was not enough, but that's pretty much a synthesis of what we talked about. Okay, thank you, Caitlin. Does anyone else in the group wanna to add to that? What, what Caitlin shared? Okay, great. So the group, the second group was the group with um, Faith Community and Mental Health Professionals Partnerships. And the facilitator for that group was Jean. And the wonderful Brianna from Marymount, who's waving there, is our reporter. Um, we had an incredible group that um, is deeply intentional and thoughtful about these issues. So um, she'll, she'll report out and everyone's invited to chime in on the chat with anything they want to add to what she says. Great. Yeah, so to jump in, um, we also expressed our own positionality with this topic as well, um, kind of gave um, where we are in our respective campuses, but then what personal things we bring to the conversation as well. So we uncovered, although we're a part of um, help helping professions in our campuses, we also come with our own um, spirituality uh, passions with our group as well. There was a lot of ministers and preachers, a lot of PKs, preachers, kids, which is why I was nominated and kind of pushed to speak in our, in our uh, larger group. Um, so we had a lot of um, experiences that were brought to the table. And so we really um, highlighted how we can build a complementary relationship between faith professionals and mental health professionals. Um, and so a lot was talked about um, how we can build those partnerships without um, leaning on silos and just how there's if you don't come with personal experiences that you should be able to open up all the many doors of opportunities that are either on your specific campus or off campus and then inviting those off campus professionals faith community members faith leaders to our campus to um, be that educational tool for our students or that listening ear to students um what else did we talk about is there anything else I'm missing our group? Oh, and also just like recognizing that although um, if we come from Catholic identifying uh, institutions or religious identifying institutions, um, that we should check our own biases when it comes to that and not lean on um, our own understanding. It's okay to ask questions to um, students that are coming from those positions and backgrounds, but then also leaning on community members and those individuals that are more spiritually and religiously connected than we are. And then also that's a caveat for individuals that are spiritual and um, have spiritual connectivity to that personally, that although you have the same title of being Baptist and, and you're connected with a student that's also Baptist, although it's the same in name, the experiences are different. Religious practices, religious traditions within um, Baptist practicing religions can be different as well. So checking those biases, checking those experiences that you come with and allowing students to come on their own with their experiences as well. Thank you. Laura, I think one of the things you bring up which is a really good point is that we have to recognize that within faith communities that there's diversity, right? There's theological diversity, there's diversity in terms of religious practices, uh, what's an okay um, uh, type of music you listen to, style of worship could be different. 
Did you guys talk anything about that and those differences and how those might be either facilitators or barriers to partnerships? Unfortunately, we didn't dive too much in that. Um, we hinted at it, but um, I think the last group before said 15 minutes was way too short. Um, but yeah, that was something we can definitely dive into more. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for group two, faith community and mental health professionals? So it's, it's just easy there. We're just gonna all meet up together and we'll be okay. <laughs> One item that I'll, I just want to reiterate, because when we talked about it a couple different times, it came up, and there were a lot of nodding heads, is this notion of um, any door is the right door to seek support. Mm -hmm. And so using sort of that metaphor, when we think about building spaces that bring lots of diverse voices together, lots of different campus resources, identifying for students what all those doors are, so that when people go through them, they can then get access behind them to additional resources. So behind it, we're all connected. So it doesn't matter what door they're going through. And I think that was a, um, a concept that resonated with folks and is, is one as we think about building partnerships and moving away from silos. It's just recognizing that I might not have all the answers, but if you walk through my door, I might be able to help you navigate to other spaces where we can get them. Thank you for sharing that, Jean. That's a really important concept. I think also, and this is probably gonna come up a little bit in the next group, that um, part of the challenge too, maybe the developmentally young adults or emerging adults are naturally questioning their religious background anyway. So there may be people who fall away from their traditional beliefs or maybe exploring other beliefs which can create tensions for them, for possibly the institution they're attending and also family. So we haven't really talked about that as well, but, um, but maybe we'll talk about that a little bit in the next group. So the last but not least group was involving families and mental health and faith and spirituality. And Danielle was our fearless leader. Danielle, is there, are you the designated person or is there another person? I am happy to be. Is there anyone who would like to speak instead of me? If not, I'm happy to start us off and have y'all join in. All right, I'll 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 start us off and then I welcome anyone to join in. So we talked about, um, you know, a, a wide variety of things, but I think one thing that um, really stood out to me in terms of what came up first, and I know that folks were trickling in, but um, I mentioned how uh, something that stood out to me from the survey was that, um, and I don't remember the wording exactly, but that um, respondents that um, were expressed higher um, affiliation or association with religious identity or spirituality, I think it was who are more spiritual, were less likely to seek counseling resources. And I thought that was really interesting and really spoke to um, Kind of maybe where we need to go um, as both spiritual and faith leaders and people who are partnering with families, right? And making sure that, um, as I know um, uh, was said earlier on in our conversation, making sure that we're echoing the same message across families, across mm -hmm. spiritual leaders, across faculty to make sure that youth are getting or students are getting the support that they deserve. So that was a challenge that came up that um, came up early on in our conversation. And uh, as we continued, we found there were a few other things that were big challenges across the board for um, our, our different participants who were all spiritual or religious leaders and um, affiliated with universities. So that's kind of the, the lens that we were speaking through, um, but a lot of challenge in terms of confidentiality, right? So figuring out how do we involve families while appreciating and respecting the confidentiality of students, both from a maybe legal sense, if there are counselors involved, but also from, as Dr. Malak mentioned, like the developmental phase of young people maybe coming to college and really looking to self-determine and explore who they are. And that might involve questioning their faith. But we know that for a lot of young people that can, faith can be a really stabilizing part of their identity um, and really figuring out what is what is the role that we can play in terms of making sure that students are, are able to explore and self-determine and figure out who they are 
without um while supporting them in to see the ways in which their faith can be something that stabilizes them and that relates to families as well or we talked about how that relates to families as well because another thing that I know some of our participants mentioned was noticing that students might also be in a phase where they are really exploring their agency. And that might mean rejecting family support in some way. Um, not necessarily because they see anything negative in their family per se, but because they're in a place where they are looking to figure out how, how do I, how, how do I get to be myself um, now that I'm in a place where I might be a little bit more independent or have the opportunity to be independent? And so really understanding as faith leaders, as spiritual leaders, how to work with those challenges um, and maybe remind or encourage students to maybe hold, hold those tensions in a way that allows them to continue to take advantage of the support that their family and their spirituality or faith provide them. Um, so those were some of the challenges that came up. And one notable um, need in terms of resources that we discussed was services in different languages. Um, and that was something that, you know, could really bridge the gap between families who might also be religious um, being able to really like be a part of these conversations around mental health with faith leaders and with faculty on campus. So those were a couple of themes that really stood out to me from our conversation, but I would love to invite other participants in our group to add anything that stood out to you and that you think is important for the rest of um, the cohort to hear. Thank you, Danielle. That was very comprehensive. Are there others from that group that want to add to what, what Danielle talked about? Um, hi, Sherry. I would hi. just mention, I put in the chat that I, I feel like as um, administrators, we need to keep promoting more graduate level degrees that allow um, counseling and divinity degrees to come together so that we, you know, so that more um, people working in campus ministry can also directly have counseling skills. Um, I think that a lot of students would feel more um, comfortable coming to see a spiritual advisor at times. Um, and, you know, if that advisor is also trained in counseling, it's a win-win. That's a really good point. I know I taught at Howard Seminary for a while and as an adjunct professor. I remember. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the challenges, so Howard University has a combined MDiv MSW program. It's fairly new. I'm sure there are other seminaries in the area that might also do that. And I think that the, the choice for them to do that was this, that in most seminaries, most um, seminarians have uh, six hours or two classes in pastoral counseling and care. It's more um, to help you with noticing or focusing on the emotional well-being of persons, but what it is not designed to do is help you to be a clinician. And that's the tension. So I know, and, and when I taught the class and people would say, well, I'm ready to do counseling. And I'd say, well, typically in the state of Maryland, that's the one I know about licensure. You don't want to call yourself a counselor because you're not credentialed for that. And in some states, like the, MD, the DMV area, because it's a high, relatively speaking, a high concentration of mental health providers in this area, the licensing laws are stricter here. So the label that you use is really important. And if you use the wrong label um, and then something happens, you can be sued and you'll lose <laughs> because they will basically say you're, you're, um, you're offering services that you're not technically credentialed to provide. So I think even when people say spiritual counseling, I so be careful with the word counseling. Spiritual um, advisor. Right, yeah, you know, because that can get you in trouble. At the same time, I, I respect that and I understand the legalities. I, I feel like we need to move towards a place where there are fewer silos you know, between our disciplines because I know that we can be very clutchy about our disciplines. Um, but but at the end of the day, students are interdisciplinary and we need to support them more holistically. That's such an important point. And where we really saw this play out in real time was COVID, right? So when COVID came, we had a simultaneous increase in risk factors and decrease in uh, protective factors. So mental health challenges went way up. It was one of the few times in my whole life 
where I saw all states, I believe every state did this, relaxed their credentialing and criteria for telehealth. So for a little while, every state you lived in, I don't care where you lived, you could get help. And so, and this is really important for students because students went home, but they may have been connected to a, a, a therapist at the counseling center at their school, at the university. So you might be in DC at Trinity for your education, but you had to go back home to Virginia and people and, did, and Trinity is in DC and Virginia is in Virginia. So it was the one time where we let people do that. Uh, I think that unfortunately we've gone back to the older models, but this is a good time for mental health consumers and families in particular to advocate to let's do things that are more flexible or telehealth or even being more flexible about who can be a provider because the other thing that happens, this is not part of the Templeton study, but some of my other research is that once young people go to a counseling session with their pastor or with someone in the faith community, they're less likely to go to a mental health professional. So it's kind of like once they go and they've had a couple of sessions with clergy, they're probably not going to go to a mental health professional. So we need to provide additional training for clergy and for even lay leaders um, to, to, to provide them, equip them to be more helpful or to be helpful to people. But also, and this comes out in the survey, we need to partner together because we don't know, because we're in silos, we don't know how to make good referrals either. And that's a big, 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 big challenge because there are students who want mental health services, but they don't want them on campus. You know, they're not, or they, they feel that the campus services are not um, robust enough or they don't feel comfortable in terms of confidentiality. So I think we need to make sure we broaden the types of uh, services that are available to students and also, what can we do to be preventive, right? We don't have to wait for students to be in crisis. What are the things we can do to be preventive so that students can get services? Yes, um, Han, I'm sorry, I don't know your first name, but I see your hand is raised. Melvin. Hi, Melvin. Hi, I, I just wanted to piggyback on something you said. One of the difficulties uh, in the VA when we're dealing with returning veterans with multiple diagnoses is overcoming this uh, understanding scope of practice. So social workers are doing what psychologists are doing, psychologists are doing what chaplain. So there's this mix. So one of the things that happened, I think it was out of Duke, they, uh, they started a research uh, uh, program that talks about how do you get different team members, the psychologist, the social worker, the chaplain, to all kind of talk to, to get out of their silos and talk to each other and use dialogue where we can understand at the root cause what's going on with returning veterans. So uh, in, in our group, we talked about having a shared language and being able to talk with, one, with each other because at the end of the day, it's about healing, it's about searching for right. meaning, it's about connectedness. So, uh, so I like this conversation about how to dialogue together and have some shared meaning. And the other piece was um, developmentally, uh, you know, sometimes we have a more archaic understanding of, uh, of our religious experiences. Crisis happens and then we're like, ah, I've got to change all that. Where is God in the midst of all this? So I think that, that um, having appropriate developmental dialogue and intersectional dialogue with other providers will be helpful to provide holistic care. Thank you, Alvin, for those really important comments. We're gonna unfortunately have to stop right now. I'm gonna turn it back over to Brandy, who is gonna lead us into our next session. But thank you all so much for your breakout feedback and for your comments and questions. Thank you, Dr. Malek, and to all of you for the rich participation and discussion. I think we could have this conversation for hours and hours. Um, so thank you to everything that everyone has shared. I think some of the key things I would note here, um, you know, some of the themes is integration and also modeling. Like what is the self-work that we are doing as leaders in this profession or as student leaders, right? And how can we enter into conversations with humility and curiosity and respect for the traditions or the understanding that our students have, um, whether it's around mental health or, or spirituality. So thank you for that.
Um, I think something that's also really important in terms of uh, mental health and spirituality is giving ourselves a break. And so right now we are going to have a brief movement break sponsored by Peloton, and then we'll resume in just a few minutes. Hi everyone, it's Mariana Fernandez, and thank you so much for joining us at the Converge Conference, where we focus on the intersections of faith, spirituality, and mental health in our students of color. So at this moment, I'm just gonna invite you to find a comfortable seat, find your space, take a moment, and check in. Once you've landed in that space, you can either close your eyes, keep them open at a soft gaze, and just in your posture, start to relax the shoulders and give yourself some time, some grace to take the journey inward. And as you reflect throughout the conference, can you see what the primary emotion is? If you can find yourself in a state of balance, Take this time to notice if anything feels off kilter and see how you can shift. Bring yourself back to a space of equilibrium. And again, if the mind begins to wander or take off to another space, close your eyes. Take a deep full breath in and reset. And you also, as you find your balance and find that grace, add some self-compassion, knowing that emotions can start to surface or certain feelings, accept them, recognize them, and give yourself that space, that compassion towards yourself to allow yourself to feel anything that comes in and anything that you'd like to keep. Take a deep breath in, sigh it out. Once you've checked in with that inner balance, granted yourself some compassion, accepted where you are, can that lead you into a space of interdependence where you maintain your values, you accept them, but you can also create an emotional bond with those around you, with the information that you're receiving, with a different point of view, and accept yourself there. If you're not there already, I invite you to now close your eyes bringing in all of these different points that you wanna keep yourself, that you wanna to keep towards others. And if you feel like you start to falter, come back to one in particular, make that your North Star and leave with that. Take a deep, full breath in, part your lips, Side out, gently open your eyes. You reset and we launch from here. Have a great conference, everyone. Thank you so much, Mariana and Peloton for sponsoring that movement break for us. Hopefully folks are feeling a little more relaxed as we're continuing on with our wonderful program today. Um, our next session is a deep dive into the Inspires Campus Climate Index. The Inspires Index is an assessment tool that measures, evaluates, and represents an institution's efforts toward and commitment to establishing a welcoming climate for students of different worldview identities. We are fortunate to have Dr. Musba Shaheen, a key contributor to the Inspires Campus Climate Index project with us today to share about this initiative. 
Dr. Shaheen, take it away, please. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for for having me and for inviting me to be here. I'm I'm really happy that this work is 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 happening. Um, you all are really doing amazing things. And so, what I wanted to do in the time that we have together is to talk about inspires, talk about you know in general what the what the tool is, um, how it operates, what uh, you can do to be involved. Um, I will also note that I'm not uh, uh, I'm not using slides with me today. However, the the uh, information is present in the resource uh, uh, portion of the platform, and so if you do want to follow along, or if you just want to uh, refer to the information later on, uh, you're welcome uh, to do so. I will end uh, my time with you by talking a little bit from. Uh, about our findings related to spiritual wellness that we drew from qualitative uh, data and the case studies that we've conducted across institutions. Um, so what is the INSPIRES Index? The INSPIRES Index is the Interfaith Spiritual, Religious, and Secular Campus Climate Index. It's run by Dr. Matt Mayhew um, at Ohio State and Dr. Alyssa Rockenbach at NC State. Essentially, the spirit of the index is to take all of the information that we've learned about religion and spirituality on our college campuses within the last decade or two and turn them into uh, a tool that institutions can use to benchmark uh, uh, and assess for themselves uh, how welcoming they are as campuses for people who hold diverse uh, religious, spiritual, and secular identities, or as I will continuously say, RSS identities. And so, our goal with the index was also to start a public conversation uh, about the importance of religion and spirituality as a component of the collegiate experience, specifically with college choice. So our vision for this project has been to create an online tool that uh, uh, prospective students and families could go to as they are trying to make decisions about which college campuses are going to be the most accommodating, the most welcoming, uh, or the most inviting for their RSS, um, for RSS needs. So over the years, we've learned some things about uh, what makes for a welcoming climate. Uh, we learned that uh, uh, two informal social activities or social engagement with, with difference, at least one academic engagement with difference, uh, as well as at least one friend with a different worldview, um, uh, those are all things that contribute to creating a, um, a, a productive campus climate. In addition to having diversity policies on campus and creating environments that challenge assumptions without, without inducing harm. And all of these things come at the benefit to, uh, to specifically for students who hold marginalized religious and spiritual identities who have to navigate a dominant campus culture. Uh, but at the same time, these ultimately benefit all of our students who are in, in our campus environment. So what we wanted to do is, again, provide this sort of metric for how institutions understand how well they're, 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 they're doing in terms of welcoming campus. And so there's a few... Um, uh, we call them uh, subscores, or we call them uh, areas within the, the index that we provide institutions feedback on. That includes religious accommodations, institutional behavior, uh, efforts to reduce negative engagement, extracurricular engagement, spaces for uh, spiritual expression, academic engagement, and structural diversity. Uh, the index looks basically like a star system. Um, we took all of our research and turned it into a, an inventory. Then we created a, an algorithm that uh, weighs different components of that inventory uh, differently based on how significant it is as a predictor of welcoming campus climate, not just in general, but for specific groups based on the empirical data, atheism, uh, Buddhism, uh, Islam, Judaism, et cetera. Um, and so we hypothesize this ideal institution score that has all of these programs and services, and we measure all of our institutions against that ideal. Uh, the goal of that is that we're always aspiring to be to be better. The goal is not to create a hierarchy of institutions, although ultimately, whenever you're trying to assess anything, you end up creating hierarchies of institutions. Uh, but we didn't want to provide a one, two, three uh, sort of ranking. This is not a ranking tool. 
this will give institution stars one through five. Um, and we'll give them uh, the subscores for all of these things that I had mentioned earlier. So two institutions might both have three stars in general, but could have strengths and weaknesses or areas for improvement among different dimensions of their uh, spiritual uh, campus climate. I will also point out that um, this tool is completely free to institutions. We have very generous funders from the uh, Vining Davis Foundation, other Vining Davis Foundation. Um, and as I like to say, we're literally just begging people to take it. Um, and that is sort of inspired also by, inspires, inspired, inspired by the idea of assessment as intervention. We're hoping that whenever institutions sort of take the step of taking this inventory, looking at, okay, what sort of policies and structures and program exist on your campus that that in itself creates awareness of these things. The index also includes a public component that you can see at inspiresindex.org. Uh, the goal of that, again, we want is to be accessible, but as you all might already figure out, some institutions are a little um, not interested or a little concerned about uh, sharing their scores publicly for various reasons. Uh, actually, some institutions, especially our publics, were specifically did not want to participate for fear of uh, sort of getting in heat with uh, with with people who uh, perhaps misunderstand um, what the separation of church and state is. Uh, I saw a call to share the link, and I saw that Brandy has already shared it. So thank you, Brandy. Uh, that is the link to the online index. You'll see that we have 180 institutions, but not all of them are on the website. Um, and that's because institutions had the um, had the choice to opt in to sharing their data publicly after they received their reports. And that's also uh, uh, by design, we didn't want people to not take it or not participate in this assessment as intervention strategy because they are worried about their scores so or that their scores are going to be public. So they can decide later. Some of them even did not want their particular scores shared, but they agreed for us to tell the world that they have participated um, in, 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 this, in this initiative. We're hoping that this sort of uh, incentivizes institutions to show the world that we do care about this area of uh, support for our students. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, there's also a search tool that's related with the index. It's still in its beta version, so unfortunately I can't share it with you right now, uh, but the goal of it is for, uh, for students to be able to filter by institution type, by region, um, or search for particular institutions. Um, I, I re repeat and say that the index is one of the many tools that institutions can use to assess their climate um, and see how welcoming they are. It's not intended to replace uh, campus climate assessment. Uh, it is intended to give institutions an idea of where to start. Typically, we've seen those bring institutions together in some very interesting ways, specifically uh, the, per the person who is the point person may not know all the answers. So sometimes that is the chaplain, sometimes that is someone from a, a DEI office, sometimes that's the person from assessment. Um, and so, you know, the person from the, the chaplain may not know all of the answers to questions about academic programs and academic accommodations. So we've seen that bring uh, departments and divisions together to say, okay, well, uh, either splitting up sort of the areas and the questions among them or uh, sitting together at the table and saying, what do we know about this? And so, uh, so far in the year one, we had 180 institutions. Our goal was 150. And so we were very, very happy to, to sort of go over whatever, what we had even uh, thought we could do. And in the second year, we have been able to grow our numbers to nearly 260 um, institutions. Um, they're still uh, in the process of deciding who's going to go public and who's not going to go public. Uh, I also say, and I, I, I really enjoy this part because I have been advocating for it, is that we uh, are taking a different approach in year three, and that is that institutions who have, you know, have 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 not participated officially, that we have uh, the people power now uh, to find the information ourselves. So the goal is to say, you know, it's Shaheen University did not participate in the index, but what can we find out about this university or institution uh, based on their website? Because this is how students are going to be finding information. And in the spirit of 
serving the needs of our students, we are going to do it for them. And what I anticipate will happen is that colleges and universities would much rather take control of the narrative um, and uh, sort of fill out the tools themselves than they are to sort of uh, uh, sort of leave that up to us. Um, and so that we'll see how that's going to go, uh, but we are really excited about the future of of this index. So I'm going to give you a little bit of um, a little bit of insights from the first year of what the landscape of our sample has done. First of all, there are no five stars institutions. Uh, we actually only have 14 institutions that have received four stars. That means these institutions have had between 60 and 80 percent of the ideal score. Um, the, uh, the, so there are no five stars. That means that we have a long way to go, but we have a set of institutions that we think of at this point as the exemplary institutions who are doing the, um, uh, the, the things that are giving them an edge over others. We'll find that the um, four stars and institutions are most likely to be private non-sectarian or actually uh, private non-sectarians followed by mainline Protestants. Um, Publics and evangelicals are all within the one, two, and three stars, which does not surprise people. Um, and our conversation here is de dedicated towards wellness, and I want to connect everything that we have found to this to this to this idea of wellness. So let's talk. Thinking about dietary accommodations uh, as sort of serving the basic needs of our students uh, within being able to find places to eat, uh, we have found that 45%, so a little less than of a half, of institutions have dietary accommodations in at least some of their dining facilities, and 30% will have those options at every dining hall. So what that means is that if I was a student at the 30 at 70% of these institutions, I can't just go and I needed halal food or I needed kosher food or vegetarian food. I can't just go to any residence hall. I have to plan my meals around, uh, sorry, any dining hall. I have to plan my meals around uh, uh, around my where I, I can eat, where I have food I can eat. And actually more than half of the times, I just, I don't have that option. Uh, so thinking what that means to our students, not just in terms of physical wellness, but also in terms of belonging on campus, of, of creating uh, opportunities for connections across the, uh, the the dinner table or the lunch table um, are all things that are, we are worthy of our attention. Here's another thing that we've found. Bias response teams are very common. We have 63% of institutions have a dedicated bias response team or group. It's great. Tracks really well with our, I mean, there's always room for better. Tracks really well with the trends that we're seeing. Uh, however, only 28% to 30% of those, as in three out of 10, um, have specific training to address religious spiritual bias when they arise. So things like Islamophobia and um, anti-Semitism on campus. So what that really tells me is that the majority of institutions do not prepare these bias response groups to, uh, to, 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 to respond to these incidents that are becoming more and more common on our college campuses. And that to me indicates that we might be trying to either not fully understanding the intersection of identities and of incidences of bias that might occur, but also uh, are all these bias response teams performative as a way, oh, we have it, uh, but are you preparing this group to do uh, what uh, uh, needs to be done to address issues of bias when they arise on a college campus? Looking closer to training and development um, about sort of religious diversity, uh, when it comes to our faculty, so 36% uh, of our institutions sort of encourage their faculty to do this. Uh, but only 8% sort of train faculty to do this. So this is, this is again, the, the difference as institutions do go doing things to create a better climate for our students is that uh, sort of are very, very uh, not likely to prepare faculty to engage in these conversations in classrooms. Um, and 56%, so more than half, neither train nor encourage. This comes from the idea of leaving, sort of leaving it up to the faculty, um, the academic freedom uh, sort of component is, it is, is very important. What that ends up meaning though, is that even things like accommodations are in the hands of faculty. Faculty are the ones who grant accommodations. Uh, faculty have the option of whether to not include a, a religious accommodations on their syllabi um, and things like that. And so there, uh, there is room for 
more infrastructure to sort of create a base for our students to be protected um, or to have the support that they need. Uh, in addition, we looked at uh, functional areas across campus uh, and we wanted to see which areas receive a particular training or preparation to address a religious and spiritual diverse uh, campus body. And so the most likely to offer this are our residential life folks um, at 30%. Uh, I, I find that to actually be low because uh, if residential life tends to be heavy on the training and so that 30 percent um, is, is not a lot uh, uh, but it is the highest and it is followed by uh, mental health counselors uh, 30 percent or 29 actually uh, sort of include this sort of training in their preparation you see that percent go down uh, for health center staff at 10 percent uh, for academic advisors at seven percent and for career counselors at five percent uh, part of what that we've been talking about with this finding has been the the um, not making the connection between spirituality and religion and things like academic and academic uh, trajectory and career options, things about uh, related to purpose and goals and sort of connectedness are not things that we have been associating with with those like you go to college to find a job, uh, whereas. Um, we believe as higher ed um, scholars that the point of it to find sort of a purpose to find what you want to contribute to the world, which are very much related to uh, academic conversation. I also noted that uh, as expected, our institutions that are sect uh, sectarian, so that are a, you know Catholic or evangelical or Protestant, uh, are the most likely to indicate uh, sort of uh, support for religious struggle outside of uh, mental health and counseling. Um, and that does not surprise us. These, in, these environments tend to be more, uh, more likely to engage in that sort of conversation or dialogue outside of, of, outside of uh, uh, mental health and wellness as an, as an unusual sort of uh, uh, campus uh, environment. Uh, there's a lot that can be said about sort of um, the professional standards for our mental health uh, providers and advisors and counselors and how they can engage in these uh, conversations related to religion uh, and spirituality and wellness uh, for our college campuses or for our students on our college campuses. Okay, uh, let me see what I was like after you. So from a qualitative sense in our case studies, uh, I, I, I want to share some of the uh, sort of common uh, challenges and responses that we see from who we call uh, institutional champions. Uh, these are the people on a particular institution who uh, have championed interfaith effort, have championed supporting our students. And that can look like a you know residence hall coordinator that can look like a chaplain that can could look like a program coordinator for religious life um, so the the roles really vary but we have looked across the board to see a what sort of challenges are facing students in terms of their spiritual wellness and their spiritual connectedness and how these champions uh, have been supporting them through that so a lot of the time spiritual dissonance, as we called it, it comes through in, in a variety of way that create this sort of struggle. One of them is transitioning to college in terms of transitioning the systems of belief that students had uh, that they may no longer have. Uh, often looks like, you know, my pastor at home used to tell me this, but now I'm here and I'm hearing this. And now I, I'm sort of confused as to what, what, was, what was that that I learned then? And how do I fit within uh, what I learned before when I learned now? In addition to things like explorations of sexuality that tends to happen on college campuses, that also tends to be an area where students seek out spiritual uh, support or perhaps experience a dissonance on a spiritual level. Uh, also related to messaging around sexuality and identity, uh, in addition to gender, uh, in some uh, uh, in, in some institutions, and particularly for for women who've uh, been socialized in a more patriarchal uh, religious structure, uh, and that also creates this idea of of, of of dissonance. 
in addition, there is a, a spiritual dissonance that comes with the not feeling comfortable sharing is the simplest way to say it is sort of students are coming to college not feeling always comfortable to say what they believe. Um, and it's hard to, to parse out what you can and cannot say as a 18 year old coming often from places where you haven't had those conversations. And so uh, that has uh, has created a, a dissonance in the sense of students, if they don't say things and they don't process them, they don't process them, then sort of they were stuck in this in this idea of this. Just I'm just confused. I don't know what to do. I'm going to isolate myself. In addition to resource disparities, specifically for our religiously uh, minoritized students, so not having prayer spaces or ablution spaces uh, from some students, uh, um, in addition to not having a student organization uh, uh, for, for your particular group. Uh, we talk about student organizations as a double-edged sword, uh, knowing that their peer support is great, but also peer support tends to be volatile. Uh, when student leaders leave, so do their student organizations uh, without the structural support from the institution. Uh, so what has Champions been doing uh, on our college campuses to address this spiritual dissonance? The first thing is giving the agency back to the students to discuss what is their methods of centering themselves asking students what is it that they typically did at home uh, within their religious communities to center themselves, not necessarily pushing uh, prayer on them or pushing meditation on them, rather reminding them to go back to the, the whatever it is that really brings them comfort. In addition to creating uh, places where students can engage in difficult conversations um, and profound conversations. Uh, our current sort of culture tends to perhaps avoid conversations about religion because it's personal. Uh, why would you talk about that in public? But a lot of times um, students are carrying sort of profound ideas that if not discussed create distance from the, the community and create challenges for students to really find their place on our campuses. Um, and lastly, the importance of the physical uh, spaces, as in actually dedicating spaces within our facilities uh, so that students don't have to, for example, uh, find a stairway uh, somewhere to, to pray uh, or have to go back and forth between their home um, uh, or their dorm room and uh, their, their classes or having to uh, you know, buy food off campus and, 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 and not being able to eat on campus and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And sort of circling back to the Inspires tool is uh, one of the components is related to spaces. And so we allow uh, or we demonstrate to institutions how they are doing in terms of creating spaces for uh, support and expression. Uh, and we also provide them with information on to how um, and to how they're doing in comparison to uh, other people within their their group. Uh, I forgot to, to note earlier that we typically benchmark institutions towards their type as public, uh, uh, private, non-sectarian, Catholic, uh, mainline Protestant, and evangelical. And that's uh, also an empirical decision uh, because those types tend to behave differently in different measures. Um, and also because we understand that the trickiness of being at a evangelical or a mainline Protestant school where uh, supporting religious and spiritual diversity uh, sometimes feels at odds with the religious mission of the institution. And so creating the spaces can have some a lot of, a lot of times political implications, if, I, if I'm being really honest, um, that stand in the way of creating the support for our students. Um, I encourage folks to uh, look into the index if that is something that you are uh, that you're that you're interested in or that you know people on campuses that might be interested in. I also say again, the tool is free. In the in the PDF that I provided you, there is even a QR code that takes you to the actual tool, so people can actually look at it and take it. Uh, we are our our part that we need people to reach out to us for is will be the algorithming of the scoring because that's really where the the sort of the the, the back end work uh, happens. I also included some snapshots from the website in that same PDF uh, for 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 your reference. Um, I'm going to drop my uh, email in the chat. Um, I believe I am out of time. Uh, so I'm going to drop my email here. 
and ask that if you all have additional questions or comments or concerns, I know this is a very quick rundown of uh, the index, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to uh, even schedule times off uh, off camera or to, to off camera uh, beyond this meeting to talk about uh, uh, to talk about the Inspires uh, index. And uh, thank you for listening. And thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaheen. Can we give another, again, round of reactions for that presentation? Um, you know, just really great to understand what's going on on our campuses, right? Like it's great to, to understand our own experiences, talk to students, but to have a comprehensive index to really get into the nitty gritty is super important. I've found from working at a, a college, I found that sometimes we're really great at one or two of those elements that's on the index, but really lacking on some of the other elements as well. So thank you so much. And I hope folks take him up on that offer. Um, the resources in the presentation will be um, in the resources area on the platform. Um, we also shared the link and also you have Dr. Shane's email. So thank you so much. Um, so moving on with our program, uh, as you witnessed today, there are so many different themes and tracks that can be explored when we examine faith, spirituality, and mental health among our young people of color. Our next hour or so, we're going to end at 2.45 p.m. Eastern, um, will be broken into two different panel discussions. Our first panel, Navigating Mental Health, You Can Practice Your Faith and Have a Therapist, is geared toward our student participants. Our second concurrent session, Support is a Verb, Supporting Your Students to Manage Their Faith and Mental Health, is geared toward those working with student populations in any capacity. So for these two concurrent panels, we will move into breakout rooms, um, and you'll be able to select your preferred session in just a moment. Um, and we're so excited for our incredible panelists to deep dive into all of these discussions that we've been having and continuing on the themes of today. So as soon as we get a notification for breakout rooms, or maybe we already have, there we go. Y'all feel free to join. Similarly to last time, if you are having any difficulty with moving to your chosen breakout room, please raise your hand or let us know, and uh, a staff member can support you with that. Enjoy. If you are having any trouble joining a breakout room, please feel free to come off mute and let us know, and we are happy to assist. Let me just kind of sit, chime in here and see what they're talking about. Oh, I don't hear nothing.
Again, just to reiterate, if you are having problems um, getting into your room of choice, if you're unsure, please feel free to reach out to us and we are more than happy to assign you to the room um, to get you set up to be successful. We'll give everybody another minute to join their breakout rooms. Um, and then anyone that is remaining, we will put in a temporary waiting space. And I think some of the things that I've been hearing has been around connecting, right? Connecting with self, connecting with students, and also connecting with one another across professions. So I'm so excited to introduce the provost at Trinity Washington University and the Steve Fund board member, Dr. Colota Ocampo, to moderate our final session today. Dr. Ocampo received her PhD in neuropsychology from Howard University and holds an MS and a BS from Howard as well. Her scholarship explores pedagogical reform for changing student populations, race incident trauma, ethnicity, gender, and disease. With that, I'm passing the mic off, Dr. Ocampo. Thank you so much for that lovely uh, introduction. I, I wasn't expecting it. And also, um, I'm glad you gave the short version. Oh, my goodness. Well, thanks, everyone, for sticking it out up till now. It's been a big, rich, full day with so much great connection. I don't know if everyone else is. I'm feeling a glow already. But um, now we're going to be talking about um, how we kind of wrap everything up and make these connections to really benefit um, student mental health on our campuses. And I'm going to ask my panelists to introduce themselves, and then I'll have a few introductory remarks, and we'll go into questions. So Dr. Phipps. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Acampo. I'm so uh, happy to be here with everyone this afternoon. So I am Ricardo Phipps, uh, and I currently serve as the, the Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Stevenson University in Owings Mills. Uh, in terms of disciplinary background, uh, I'm a professional counselor. Uh, also uh, have a background as a uh, Catholic priest and have had the, the really the privilege and the pleasure of working in uh, college counseling centers in, uh, in a few different institutions. So I'm, I'm kind of coming with that lens today as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. And our student panelist, uh, is it Ms. Caitlin Andrus? Am I saying that correctly? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Andrus, and I am a graduate student at Duke University School of Medicine, pursuing my master's in biomedical sciences. I graduated from St. Edwards University with a BA in psychology and a minor in biology. And in terms of my um, mental health passion, I have worked with NAMI as a youth presenter, 
um, for their program, Ending the Silence. I also am on the Youth Advisory Board with the Steve Fund. So I'm really looking forward to be speaking with you all today about this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, in, order for, in order to fully support the thriving and success of students of color in higher education, our institutional cultures and practices must change. Student of color mental health and emotional wellness has traditionally not been prioritized on college campuses. And we see the results, various metrics of belongingness, well-being, and ease lag among students of color. And this could also contribute to the lower retention and graduation rates that we see among these students. Uh, we conceptualize institutional intervention and transformation as needing to happen at three levels. There needs to be change to the level of the administration with practices and policies in academic and student affairs. There also needs to be change in the curricula and in academic and co-curricular programs around inclusive excellence. And finally, we need change at the level of the student experience up to and including the clinical experience and counseling centers, as well as between faculty and students in classrooms and between students and each other in uh, their campus experiences. So we hope that um, through talking with Dr. Phipps and Ms. Andres, we can help gain a greater understanding of impacts um, of practices in student populations. And um, we'd like to examine the importance of trauma-informed institutional leadership in dismantling barriers to equity. And finally, implementing some successful solution-oriented initiatives in the very little time we have left, which is just about a half an hour. So this is obviously a much, much longer conversation. But Dr. Phipps, let's start with you. You're an academic dean right now. You've had many roles, as you mentioned. You're also trained clergy. Um, so you're right at the intersection of the topics that we have today. What efforts um, have you seen on campuses or are currently in place at your campus to support students' mental health? Thank you for that question, Dr. Ocampo. Uh, a couple of things that really stand out for me uh, at my current institution, I think the intentionality about uh, hiring of diverse uh, counseling center staff, I, I just think is, is really mm -hmm. critical. Um, and I think looking at that from two different standpoints. First, I think there, there need to be staff that are reflective of the identities and the backgrounds of students at an institution, but all, all staff in counseling centers uh, at colleges and universities need to come with kind of a social justice uh, and, and diversity mindedness, um, a, a real commitment to cultural humility, I think is, is just important to make sure that that's an integral part of the hiring process and that institutions are really intentional about that. I think the second thing that comes to mind for me with that question is making sure that more and more administration supports that mental health and wellness are not just seen as the work of the College Counseling Center but in terms of uh, opportunities for faculty and staff development, that that is always there. So whether it's things like mental health first aid um, opportunities, training opportunities for faculty and staff to take part in, uh, to make sure that things that could happen in classrooms or other spaces on campus that could exacerbate um, any mental health challenges a student might have or create things that are not there. Um, that, that faculty and staff are just more in tune to um, things like microaggressions and how those uh, can, can impact student wellness. So those are just a couple of things that come to mind. And then I think lastly, I just wanted to mention kind of non-clinical supports that are really important, um, whether they be affinity groups, sometimes it might even be Greek fraternities and sororities or, or things like that, but opportunities for students to get together with other students uh, who come from similar backgrounds and just to have a strong sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I, I really agree that administrators need to not only hire for mission very intentionally, but also provide training for all faculty and staff. Um, it, it's important to have more faculty and staff of color, but it's also important to provide training to everyone on the campus to be able to overcome the unconscious biases that just come from living in, a, you know, in the system that we live in, in a white supremacist system and you know, enable people to um, extend uh, an increased consciousness, to bring an increased consciousness and self-awareness to interactions that they might have and be able to acknowledge, like I didn't maybe do that exactly the best way, but I can get better next time. 
Um, there's room for growth for everyone, but we have to get started. It's a difficult conversation. Ms. Andrus, what are you seeing as some of the biggest barriers um, or hearing, you know, with your peers with regards to um, well-being and their well-being and mental health journeys? There are definitely a couple of barriers that I have seen amongst my peers, also being a graduate student myself, one of them being a part of a generous curriculum that makes it hard to have a balance, um, especially if you are a perfectionist or a high achieving student or a first gen student and you have a lot mm -hmm. of expectations on yourself, it can be really hard to even make the time to slow down. And along with that, when you do slow down, a lot of my peers have expressed guilt when they take time for themselves. They feel like, well, dang, if, if I take a little break, does that mean I'm working less? Does that mean I'm studying less? So it's the difficulty that students have between separating their academic life from their personal lives and the identity that comes along with that. And also, just being emerging adults and um, learning about yourself. And as, especially in college, undergrad, graduate level, you're an emerging adult and you're learning about, okay, I wanna be more independent. I wanna have more of a voice. And that can be a lot of pressure, social pressure. So on top of school. So there's just a lot of things going on with being a young adult. And I'm sure other students who are attending can relate. Mm, thank you for sharing that. What do you, um, in what ways do you think, what, if you were able to talk to faculty and staff, which you are right now, what would you um, ask them for to better support students in their, you know, well-being journeys? Absolutely. I think first and foremost, setting the stage at the very beginning, especially at mm -hmm. each new semester, mm -hmm. opening up that conversation. And since they are the faculty, the adults, the models, being the model and saying it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And if you open up that conversation and create that space for students to feel safe to come to you, then maybe there won't, they won't feel as much guilt or shame. So that that's one thing. And, and also just, um, I know we talked about this earlier in one of the sessions, but setting up something within the curriculums like mental health days can be very helpful instead yes. of just ha having them two times in the, the whole school year. I think we need more than that. And, mm -hmm. You know, it shouldn't be something that is minimal. It, it should be as just as much priority as physical health. So that, that those are my recommendations. Yeah, I love that campus wide mental health days. In fact, my campus is doing that right now. Um, two mental health days per semester. Um, and I think that's a great recommendation that people can choose to use, you know, when they feel like they need it. Um, I also wanna say something about modeling. You mentioned about modeling and, you know, I used to teach psychology courses. Now I don't have time, unfortunately. I take some independent study students. But in my classes, I always used to say, hey, I'm a psychology professor. And I will openly tell you, I have accessed therapeutic, services when I have felt like they could, I needed them in my life and they were really helpful. And people would say to me and students would say to me, but Dr. Ocampo, you seem so together. Like how come you would need therapy? And I said, okay, put, put those two statements side by side and think about it. What do you think it's helped me seem so together? You know, and, and I, I kind of see a light bulb go off with students like, oh, wow, you know, here's this person that I think, you know, is so together and knows her stuff and whatnot. And yet she too has, you know, no qualms about saying, yeah, I've seen a therapist. It's great. I think everybody should have therapy. Problems are not because it is so wonderful to have that experience of someone just really listening and offering that um, compassionate, you know, unconditional regard. Um, and that modeling, I think, is something that we need to, now not every, not every faculty member is gonna to wanna to talk about their personal things with, with students, but nevertheless, I agree with you about being able to have that open conversation. Um, Dr. Phipps, as we try to shift to a trauma-informed perspective as, as administrators, as faculty, you know, kind of from the students are the problem, you know, problematizing the students to, what happened to the students can be 
causing some of their problems and issues as they adjust. So from, you know, problematizing to what happened to you um, is the problem. How, how, do you, um, how do you guide a faculty who want to support their students by engaging in this shift to a trauma-informed perspective? That's a great question. One thing that comes to mind is really helping faculty to kind of develop um, somewhat of a more empathetic approach to, to, to the listening that they do to students' stories. Mm -hmm. Not to say that faculty in our institutions aren't teaching and leading with empathy, but to help them to, to even be more attuned to the, the real life experiences of students today. Because I think if, if we're, we're thinking about a lot of the institutions in which many of us serve, including my institution, a large number of students are working and not just sometimes working part-time, many students work full-time uh, and they are actually supporting themselves largely. They may have a minimal amount of financial support from family. And it's not always that they come from families that don't want to support them. They just may not have the resources. And so students have a lot of responsibility on themselves often. And not only are they coming with the obligation and the need to support themselves, but they're coming with experiences and things that have happened to them. I, I've worked with students that may have gone through the foster care system or just have, have had a lot of challenges uh, through life and it's not always the story of faculty. And on the flip side of that, I sometimes heard faculty say things like, well, when I was in school, I never would have done this, or this is what would have been expected of me, or I would have handled this this way. Or when my son or my daughter was in undergraduate, this is the way it was. And I think oftentimes we're just dealing with a different reality. And it's, it is what it is but helping faculty to, to, to kind of assume positive intent from, from students. Even though students may not always respond to situations the way faculty want to, but to realize that students are generally there because they want to be there. They want to learn, they, they're there because they want to grow, but they may need different supports. And that doesn't lessen their sense of commitment or their motivation or their desire for education. So I think just, Constantly having those types of conversations with faculty is important um, and, and getting different faculty members to share different experiences they've had of being able to create that environment for students is helpful. Mm -hmm. Many times, uh, you know, in my experience, faculty will say, well, you know, you're asking me to lower my standards by extending flexibilities to students around, you know, mental health. Do you have any um, specific strategies or, or trainings that you do with faculty to help them understand compassionate rigor? I, I do think clear expectations from the beginning um, are important. So if it's not an institutional policy, I think it's good to have policies about reception of late assignments or things of that nature in syllabi. So students have clear expectations. I think that is important. That, that students are able to know upfront what expectations are, but faculty just being coached and, and, and nudged to have individual conversations with students and always to realize that things are, are generally not as black and white as we might want them to be, but there's always case by case situations. And when you actually talk with an individual student and you open yourself up to find out what that individual situation is, that might dictate whether or not there's some leniency that really is warranted there, or if, if there, there might be times when a student really does need to face consequences of late assignments and whatever that means. But I think encouraging faculty to first and foremost talk with students individually outside of class to find out what's going on and, and, and being guided from that individual conversation they had about how they will handle situations. But I certainly, I, I do not want to ever come off as if I'm encouraging faculty to, to just lessen rigor and lessen expectations. We never want to do that. But at the same time, I always think the end goal is we want students to learn and to be able to get assignments completed. If they don't always get them completed along our timelines, that doesn't mean that the learning can't happen. That's great. Um, I think that um, Dr. Molak had a comment about uh, that where I'm just going to, uh, Dr. Molak, did you want to make your comment that you put in the chat? Oh, I just, I like what um, Dr. Fitz was saying about 
the comparison across generations like back in the day, but it's really not comparable. And so I think we educate differently. We have different light circumstances. We live in different contexts. When I was growing up, there was no internet. There was no computer. There, we went to the library. <laughs> But also there are students who have mental health challenges. In my generation, they wouldn't have gone to college. That was not gonna be an option for them. So with the advent of medication and other forms of treatment, more and more people can come to um, you know, institutions of higher learning. What's not, for me, what's not caught up with that is we don't have the mental health staff to, hand, to provide treatment for this number of students. So, mm -hmm. And we know, you know, those of us who work in this area, 20% of people will have depression in their lifetime. Do we have the staff on campus to match that number? And the answer is no. So when, when people say all oh, these students are flaky and I'm like, you know, I have young adult children too. And I always, like I always said earlier, I want people to treat my children. I want to treat students the way I want someone to treat my child. Absolutely. And my children don't always have it all together. <laughs> so we, we can't hold, we can't hold our students to higher standards than we do ourselves or our own families or our own loved ones. Right. Because That's all of our students are part of, you know, for those of us who have a religious background, well, you know, just speaking for myself, in my experience, we are all part, you know, quote, I don't mean to be trite, we're all part of a human family. We're here to be shepherds for each other. But, and, even, but even the even my graduate students sometimes complain about the undergraduate students they're TAing for, and I have to remind them they're not you. You're in a you're in a PhD program. You're in kind of by definition self motivating. Somebody you know, in my abnormal class is not a PhD student yet, so they're that's a right. Thing. That's right. And and unfortunately, I think we we replicate. Unfortunately, the academy replicates itself in its hazing practices. And we have to we have to learn how to transform more with respect to what you were just saying and Dr. Phipps was saying about the new the you know the young people listen they they have a lot of things figured out that we didn't have figured out thing one and thing two we need to shift the way that we do business um, in in a in in broad strokes um, in order to really support and make sure that we are being student centered and moving to a trauma-informed perspective. Um, you mentioned about um, social media and I wanted to turn to Caitlin because there's this huge, and, and Dr. Han, I think I see your question, I'm gonna get to it next. Don't worry, that is an important topic we're gonna get to it. It's, I hope it's Han, I hope I'm saying that right. Jones, uh, sorry, V-H-A-H-I-N Jones M2. <laughs> Get Mel Jones is fine. Mel Jones is fine. Perfect. Perfect Jones. Okay. Uh, but, but Caitlin or Do uh, Ms. Andrews, you know, um, we hear a lot about, you know, how social media is impacting young people. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I connecting to the Do Dr. Jones's, um, you know, comment, we know that, for example, um, you know, racial battle fatigue and secondary trauma from viewing mm -hmm. all the craziness in the media, um, can really be impactful uh, on, on students' mental health. And then there are other things, just, just you know, this, you know, the social um, kinds of connections that students have to navigate in, in media. So in a world of digital connection, how do you think um, technology and social media affects students' mental health? And, you know, do you think that these media can be used in positive ways? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. We definitely live in the social media age now and everything is online even with school everything is for the most part online assignments online this online that and so we're moving mm -hmm. with the times and I will say in terms of social media it's like a double-edged sword there are some good things that can come out of it and then there's some not so good things that can come out of it um for example Mm -hmm. with Instagram or Twitter, you're constantly being exposed to things and there's no way to filter what you see, or it's not as easy to filter what you see. And lately there's just constant um, tragedy going on and, and I should say um, bad news. And that can have an impact, like you were seeing the secondary trauma of, of just seeing other people getting hurt. And as a student, that can be really hard to see and navigate because it can make you feel a little helpless. So there's that. Um, and then there's also the social pressures that come along with social media of 
you see what people want to post, what they want to share with the world, and they have this image that they're promoting. And whether that image is authentic or it's not authentic, there might be some pressure to uphold a certain standard. Oh, this person has a healthy lifestyle. I want to be that. And sometimes it can be motivating and inspirational, but sometimes it can make you feel guilty or like you're lacking. So I will admit the internet has definitely some positives, but it also has some downsides if it's not balanced. So kind of uh, weighing the pros and cons, I guess. Right. And um, I did want to very quickly, um, Dr. Dr. Phipps, and then I want to move on to um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Jones's question. Do you think that university sponsored social media could be deployed in a way that would be that would support students better? I, I do. I, I think that it could be a great avenue to just share information um, and, and maybe even demystify some aspects of mental health treatment uh, so that it, it becomes more of a normalized experience for students. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that there's information and also going back to the point that Ms. Andrews made uh, about modeling. I, I'm also thinking about social media from the standpoint of could it be a place where some vulnerability um, not not inviting people to just expose complete and total access to all their lives, but some vulnerability on the part of faculty or staff or other such people in, in institutions, just to, to make it clear, I, I'm human. And, I, and because we know that students go to social media and they get so much information uh, there, that, that could be a great place for students to, to kind of have initial almost in interactions or encounters with some of the people that they're going to meet at their institutions before they even get to them and kind of have a, a sense of, I'm coming here, I come with my imperfections, but I'm not going into a space where other people are claiming that they have no imperfections, but we're all gonna work together and continue to try to have a growth mindset and be the best that we can be. Thank you, thank you so much. We just have a few more minutes and I did want to shift to this question, Dr. Jones, because this is directly in my area of greatest, um, I think, you know, interest and, and, and thought. And it has to do with, in the context of America's caste system, how important is the work of mental and spiritual decolonization in identity formation and moral development um, with specific um, attention to how do we help students you know, kind of exist in a society, you know, where they're, they're going to experience microaggressions and macroaggressions and also feelings of guilt and shame. So I, I want to say two quick things and then ask both our panelists to, to say something about that. Um, first of all, you know, the Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, um, really is a great way to enter into understanding that America does have a caste system, which many people deny. Um, and so I'll just drop that resource there. And, and also, you know, one of the most impactful statements that um, I absorbed from Bishop Desmond Tutu is the idea that the greatest evil of racism is that it can make a child of God feel like he or she is not a child of God. And that is just, that is, that is to me the deepest moral stain, um, a deep moral stain with respect to living in a white supremacist system. So I absolutely agree that um, spirituality can be deployed to restore, you know, people's sense of being inherently, you know, a child of God and part of God's universe. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to my much more qualified panel to discuss this, Dr. F uh, Fitz first, and then Ms. Andres can. I think at that point we'll be out of time. We've got about three minutes. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, so yeah. one quick thought that comes to mind, because this is this is a great question. So thank you for bringing this up. Mm -hmm. But institutions really have to, to start at the top in terms of, of who they are, what their mission is what their missions are in terms of acknowledging that, that they have been instruments of colonization and power and privilege dynamics and reinforcing those. Whether it's a higher education institution, whether it's a religious institution, I think institutions tend to do that. And, and so being able to, to, to accept that that is the case, but, but it is possible to continuously work against that. And it, it, and it has to be a kind of a, um, a mutual collaborative situation where 
that institution is willing to hear from students, from its constituents, if we're talking about a university or a college, about how students are experiencing um, kind of a continuation of colonization or oppression or power and privilege dynamics. So that, that notion of listening, and that could come from town hall meetings, that could come from um, focus groups, that could come from uh, classroom um, course evaluations, but, but we have to be willing to listen to the feedback that we get from students. And I, I just think sometimes in some cases, student feedback gets dismissed. And so maybe taking a step back and really looking at how do we listen to students and their experiences in a different way. Yeah, and not be defensive sometimes. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Andrus, the last word is to you for our panel. Those were really, really wonderful points. I agree that in terms of spirituality, it, it can really restore a lot of hope in people, but there is also trauma associated with faith institutions and spirituality. So just learning how to restore that hope in the human race, I should say, and, and let people know that compassion exists. It's still here. And if we just learn to be more empathetic, to actively listen and to take a step back and take ownership of our wrongs and say, hey, historically, maybe we weren't perfect. We haven't done things always the best way. Let's learn from this. Let's grow together. And I, I think that's what's important is not acting like you're perfect, but just acknowledging that things are not always perfect, but we can grow. We can grow stronger from this. Mm, thank you. That's, that's, that's deep. And, and I really felt that. Um, well, thanks. Thanks so much to you both. And I'm going to turn it over to Brandy Pretlow in a minute. But I just want to say that for anyone who is looking for additional resources of successful initiatives that you can implement, you can organization um, institutions can formally affiliate with a Steve fund to be an equity and mental health campus and get all kinds of consulting from the Steve fund to help build programming that will support students. But institutions can also take pieces of it and, and, and utilize uh, the equity and mental health framework on their own campuses. There's a bunch of resources. Sure, Brandy, Ms. Pretlow, Brandy Pretlow is gonna go over that. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you so Yay. much, Dr. Ocampo, Dr. Phipps, Ms. Angus. I just put the Steve Fund website um, into the chat. Um, always happy to chat and talk more about the resources, the programs, and the products that we have available um, through mm -hmm. the Steve Fund. Before we transition to our closing remarks for the day, there have just been so many gems and so many takeaways um, from this whole conference. So I would love for folks to take 30 seconds and you can either type a word, a phrase, or a sentence of a takeaway, but don't enter it in yet. Just type it in the chat. Don't press enter. We're going to enter it all together. So take 30 seconds. It could be a word, a phrase, a sentence, a paragraph if you're ambitious. <laughs> so take that time for a takeaway for today. And when I say go, not yet, you can send it in the chat. Thanks, Rajay. Yes, we love waterfalls here. All right. And with that, go. You can press enter and send. So I hear enlightening, encouragement and purpose, impactful, prioritizing the mental health of students, hearing from students about their experiences and needs, and spirituality does indeed restore. Thank you all for those words. With that, I will pass it off to Dr. Ashley to close us up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was navigating New Jersey traffic um, and I seemed like I came in right, right on time because I literally just left Princeton University and we were having a teaching moment about compassionate listening. And this came out of the Office of Religious Life blessed by the president of the university. And there are about 20 participants and these participants Oops, kind of coming in dark there. These participants are administrators, coaches, and assistant deans. And so what I said to them is that our goal is to plant seeds. 
to plant seeds that we can make systemic change in the institution. And, and so it's like I came in right, right on time. So I, I thank you for that. I apologize for missing the wonderful things that were being said, but let me just share, with this, share this with you as a closing. Eleanor Roosevelt said, great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. We are indebted to the Steve Fund for hosting this gathering and bringing us together to share our collective ideas, wisdom, knowledge, and experiences. I personally am grateful to Dr. Anel Prim and Deb Hodge for your kind invitation to close out this timely gathering of bright minds. I've reached a tender age where there are more goodbyes than hellos. So thank you for seeing these new faces. One housekeeping note, please complete the survey before you sign off. Please complete the survey before you sign off. I need to be uh, transparent with you that speaking to a body of souls of this stature reminds me of the mother of black psychiatry, Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross. Her mentorship of me morphed into a friendship. PHR, as we called her, summoned me to her deathbed. She wanted me to know that she turned down offers to preach her home going by internationally known orators. You preach it, Rev. Secondly, though, she whispered, I know that I'm part of an academic, scientific, and theological culture that questions the existence of God. That's what she said. Nevertheless, every morning, Rev, I wake up with one simple prayer. God, what do you want me to do today? And I will do whatever or go wherever you send me. Dr. Phyllis Harrison Ross, the mother of black psychiatry, still very much the psychiatrist, PHR sensed my sadness. And she reminded me of the painting of our 44th president of the United States of America who made this painting famous. You remember George Frederick Watts, the British painter in 1886, gave the world one of his two most famous paintings. He entitled it Hope. The dark, gloomy picture depicts a blindfolded woman sitting on a globe playing the harp with only one string. The background is almost as blank, except for one, one, one single star. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used this painting as the inspiration for his 1959 sermon entitled Shattered Dreams. One of my many mentors, the late Reverend Dr. Frederick G. Sampson of Detroit, preached numerous sermons using this painting, Hope, as his subtext. You may recall that Dr. Jeremiah Wright heard one of Sampson's sermons on hope. He, in turn, preached the same, the sermon using the painting as his backdrop, a young community organizer in his congregation named Barack Obama listened to the sermon. And later he would use that sermon as the theme for his book and presidential campaign, The Audacity of Hope. Faith, spirituality, and mental health offer hope to those who may feel all is lost and do so with good reason. You mentioned, I overheard you talking about racism and it's hard to be a person of color in America and not deal with racism on a daily basis. But hope, but hope is medicine for the soul. And sitting on the abysmal age of edge of our uncivil and polarized world, we need hope. Would you all agree with me on, on that moment? We need hope. So allow me to offer a word of thanks for the hope the Steve Fund brings. Can I just do that and I'll call it a day. First, thank you. Thank you for your research. 
thank you for your research. Each presenter, researcher, student, spiritual leader, and participant heard a cry for help. The human cry compelled you to help. However, however, to avoid harm, you knew the first step was engaging in vigorous research. Thank you. In the world, my world of practical theology, we address four issues. What's going on? Why is this going on? What ought to be going on? And how do we, we respond? That's what you did this day, today in this meeting. Steve Fun, prestigious presenters and participants, thank you, thank you for your research. You accomplished your research with the compassion of Mother Teresa. You took on this difficult assignment with the courage of Harriet Tubman. You recognize the challenges with the wisdom of Rabbi Abraham Herschel. You gave inspiration with the tenacity of First Lady Michelle Obama. When they go low, we go high. You offered healing with the calmness of the Dalai Lama. You called out injustice with the passion of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You advocated with the intensity of Malcolm X. You contributed with the drive of Patrick Mahomes. Yes, thank you for your research. Second, thank you for your reach. Look at this mosaic of souls who participated and attended our gathering. Accomplishing such goals takes intentionality and labor intensive work. Sleeves rolled up, ready to work, mind focused, you reached out. Thank you. Armed with cultural humility and compassion, you reached out to ensure a kaleidoscope of souls attended today's event. Thank you for your outreach. Because I promised to stick to the allotted time, let me just share this in closing. I preached at the Mount Olive Baptist Church in Plainfield, New Jersey. This Sunday was, it was a Sunday 10 a.m. worship service, and it was a celebration of Black men. In Christian circles, it's commonly known as Men's Day, which is far, which is often far second in popularity to Women's Day. Just saying, it is what it is. We experienced an incredible time in the Lord. I would dare say the Holy Spirit visited us in the vernacular of my tradition, we had church. After worship, I thank the pastor for the invitation, packed my bag, put on my raincoat, and began to head to the parking lot. A young adult, a young adult, college age, stopped me. One could not help but notice she was attractive with an effervescent, energetic smile. She thanked me for the sermon, and it sure felt good. <laughs> One could quickly note that her voice changed with a certain sadness embedded in her once energetic speech. She said, you may not remember me, she declared. I am Miss Sophie's niece. You eulogized her two months ago. Thank you, pastor. Then she said these words that stuck with me forever. Pastor, I will remember you forever. 24 years ago, you were my pastor at the Monumental Baptist Church, Jersey City. You probably don't remember me. And admittedly, I did not remember her to my embarrassment and shame. Here's what she said. Listen to me. Fire burnt my house down to the ground. I lost everything. All materials, possessions, pictures, clothes, memories, furniture, everything gone. This college-age young adult said, 
once the news reached your ears, pastor, you asked me what I needed. My response to you, the fire department did its best to save our home. The fire was too bad and spread too quickly. What was left of our house was torn down for safety reasons. The Red Cross came and they were there to help us. The case manager came to help us with temporary housing and necessities. The community gathered around our family to be supportive. But pastor, if I need anything, I need a Bible. Mine was lost in the fire. Now it all came back to me we were in my study at the time. And usually we have a bookcase full of new Bibles. And that day, for some reason, we did not have one. I asked her out of curiosity, why a Bible with so many other needs? And she said, because the Bible will get me through this tough time. She said, if depression drops my soul, I can read of the Psalms of David. Should I begin to ask, why me? I can read about Job. If doubt creeps in, I can read Paul in Romans saying, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Pastor, if you give me a Bible, everything else will be fine. This college age at that time, young adult said, Pastor, a new leather bound Bible was on your desk. You took it out the box. You handed it to me to touch and hold. You said, I had no idea why I ordered this Bible. I have a zillion in different versions. God must have known you would need this Bible today. It's yours. I asked you to sign it. You signed your name. You signed your name on one page and gave me the Bible. Upon my return to the hotel, I opened up the Bible and noticed an inscription that I did not recall seeing you write. The words were from one of your sermons that you had preached on BET, Black Entertainment Television. I remembered the sermon. If you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot and hold on. So when things looked bleak, I held on. When the process was slow, I held on. When doubt entered my mind, I held on. We did not meet today by chance. God wanted me to say thank you. I had one assignment today with the Steve Fund. That just say from all of us that participated and we'll see this later on on a website, thank you. So to all, to all, thank you for your research. Thank you for your reach. Thank you for doing this work of faith, spirituality, and mental health. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashley, and thank you everyone for attending. Before you leave, if you could please be sure to fill out the post survey um, for us, we would love that. And for your feedback, you will be entered to win a Peloton subscription for one year. Um, so thank you again all for participating. Thank you again, Dr. Ashley, for closing us out. Thank you to all of our presenters, facilitators, moderators, panelists, and we look forward um, to staying connected with you at the Steve Fund. Thank you so much.